Mark Rogers, TV, always talking college football 24-7, 365. And I run into, uh, on occasion, uh, somebody else who can say just about the same thing, Josh Parcell, talking college football all the time. Josh, we appreciate the time. Thanks for uh, jumping on board here on this Sunday. You've got uh, some really exciting news to share. So you're going to do a much better job of telling us about college football country <laughs> than I will. So I'll let you take it away for people that want to check out some more uh, top-notch content. Yeah, absolutely. So on August 1st, Tuesday, I'm going to be launching College Football Country. It's my own website. It'll also have a podcast, cfbcountry.com. You can go there for daily college football insight, analysis, opinion, entertainment, um, and as well as the podcast, which you can download on iTunes, Stitcher. And I'll also have some great video content coming out as well. So we're going to be doing a lot of cool things. We're going to see how it goes over these first few months. But it, it, one of the best places I think you're going to get any college football uh, insight will be cfbcountry.com starting in just a couple days on August 1st. That is very cool. I am looking forward to it, uh, definitely. Sure. All right, Josh, let's dive into the Big Ten. Uh, we talked some ACC uh, here in the last couple of weeks, uh, and we talked about that um, kind of uh, uh, theoretical crown for best conference in college football. You're, you're siding toward the ACC, but definitely gave some uh, love to the Big Ten and what uh, the league was able to accomplish last year. Let's look at the Eastern Division, vying for possibly the best division in college football. And people love those uh, recruiting rankings, and it adds up to an Ohio State win in the Big Ten East. But you may put the brakes on that uh, regarding what Penn State was able to accomplish in Happy Valley and with uh, a quarterback who's very dynamic uh, back in place. Yeah, I, I like Penn State. I know that Ohio State probably has the most talent across the board, but in my opinion, Ohio State has a better quarterback, they have a better running back, and they have just as dynamic of a group of receivers. The big question for Penn State is the defensive line. They lost some guys on that side of the ball that's, that they're going to need to replace pass rushers. I mean, last season when Penn State beat Ohio State, they sacked Ohio State, I believe, at least eight times. And that was the difference in that game. I know everybody looks at the block field goal and that return as the play of the game, but it was Penn State's ability to get pressure on JT Barrett that I thought was the difference. So Ohio State this season, very talented. They have questions on the offensive line as well. So it's going to be neck and neck. And Penn State has a very difficult path because they play Northwestern, Michigan, and Ohio State in three straight – or well, they have a buy in between the Northwestern and Michigan games – but three straight games, they're playing probably the three other three of the best teams in the in the conference. So it's going to be tough for Penn State if they can navigate that stretch. But I'm going to side with Penn State. I know Ohio State is right there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna flip a coin and I'm gonna take Penn State to win the East. I'm gonna take a very cliched approach to this next argument, Josh, because I typically don't like it. But Penn State has been a decent program during Bill O'Brien and James Franklin stay up until about week five of last year. And they didn't have the target on their back that they now have, where Ohio State's used to having that every year in the Big Ten. So Penn State may give get a, a little bit better shot from some teams this fall. No, they will. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, they're not gonna sneak up on anybody like they did last season and uh, you remember last year losing to Pittsburgh early in the year. I think Penn State learned from that too, where they may not be used to having the target on their back, but they also learned their lesson in losing an early season game, and that ended up ultimately costing them a shot at the college football playoff. So I do think that Penn State understands the importance each and every game. They're going to get a, a great effort from all those teams, including Pittsburgh, early in the season. But yeah, I, I like James Franklin. I think he's a tremendous coach. He did a lot of great things at Vanderbilt. I know some people may have some stats to try and prove otherwise, but James Franklin is a good coach. He's recruiting well. And like I said, they've got so many weapons on offense. I really, really like Penn State. They're going to be a really good team, and they're going to be fighting for that playoff berth again because it's going to be tough to try and edge out Ohio State. Even if they beat the Buckeyes, we may see the same thing happen last year where they end up missing out despite winning that head-to-head. I got to say, Josh, what I don't like about the Trace McSorley swag is that sometimes he chucks it downfield blindly, and that paid off for him with Chris Godwin most of the time being on the other end of that throw, and he's not going to be around this year, and he was high-pointing the ball like a man. We, we saw it throughout the, the entire season and against Wisconsin and USC at the end of the season just making remarkable plays, and McSorley trusted him. It got McSorley into trouble at the end of the USC game. He chucked an interception blindly. They lost the game. Uh, He's got to play a little bit more under control for my liking for Penn State. To, he's got to find that fine line between making plays and playing loose and confident, uh, but not being um, uh, a loose cannon out there uh, chucking the ball downfield. A lot to like for the Buckeyes, talent all over the field, but 
they've got to correct the issues that they had throwing the ball downfield. I don't know if it was totally JT Barrett's fault because the offensive line crumbled. You mentioned the Penn State debacle. Didn't have the playmakers that you would expect the Buckeyes to have on the outside. They need to find somebody that's going to make plays in absence of uh, Noah Brown and Curtis Samuel. Exactly. Last season was probably the most vertically challenged that Ohio State has been since Urban Meyer got there. They didn't have that Michael Thomas guy on the outside. If you remember a couple years ago when they won the national championship, Cardell Jones took over for Barrett at the end of the season, but their biggest strength was just attacking teams down the field and throwing vertical routes over and over again and relying on those deep threat receivers. They didn't have that a year ago. Plus, JT Barrett doesn't have necessarily the arm strength of a Cardell Jones to challenge defenders down the field. So you saw a lot of question marks surrounding Ohio State. I mentioned the pass protection. That was obviously a huge issue. Look, Ohio State, they've been in this position before, actually. If you remember back in 2006, they played in the national championship game. They were a great team. Heisman winning quarterback with Troy Smith. They got blown out by Florida. They came back and made the national championship game a year later. So I I don't want to overreact to what we saw in a 31-0 loss to Clemson. That was obviously the worst game that we've seen Ohio State play in nearly a decade. Certainly the worst we've seen Urban Meyer play in a long time. Thankfully, he didn't uh, retire thanks to any health issues this time around. We're going to keep him here for another year. So always good to see that. But look, I think Ohio State is incredibly talented. Mike Weber is one of the best running backs in the country. Probably doesn't get enough credit. But I, I want to see more on, on, the, on that offensive line. And Kent, like you said, JT Barrett, challenge teams down the field or else, in my opinion, we're going to see a similar team to what we saw last year. And that's a very talented team. Hey, Josh, uh, Michigan's going to be fine long term because Jim Harbaugh is one of the best in the business and he's churning out the recruits. But I think this is the season where we find out, okay, they lose all this experience and they lose it from a not a great team. They lost three games, but a very, very good team, a top 10 caliber team. So is this the, the lull year that they have to go through the pains of inexperience and trying to come back or has he ramped it up this quickly that the recruiting is going to take over and the five stars and the four stars are going to take over and young teams like Ohio State, Clemson, Alabama, they churn through without uh, there being a blip on the radar. They go through the recruiting cycles and it doesn't matter the experience level. Is Michigan at that level yet? It's tough to say. Like you said, they're a young team. I wouldn't call this season a lull. Let's not forget how great of a coach Jim Harbaugh is. Okay, He has done more with less at Stanford in his first year here at Michigan. Okay, he has taken teams that may not have stacked up on the field player by player talent wise and won 10, 11 games with those teams. So just because this is a younger team, they only return five or six starters, depending on how how you want to look at it. They are going to compete every week. Jim Harbaugh is, in my opinion, one of the three best coaches in college football. He has proven that he has done more with less every stop of the way. This may not be the most talented team he's had, but the youth on this team is going to really shine. And guys like Rashawn Gary, who didn't have a major impact last year, is going to have an even bigger impact this season. And they've got great weapons in the running game, which is going to be their bread and butter. Chris Evans is an absolute burner at running back. Kareem Walker, who was the number one running back recruit in the country last year, may not even see the field very much at being a third string guy behind Ty Isaac as well as Evans. So there's plenty of talent on this Michigan team. While it may not have the depth of an Ohio State, I think that they are going to compete. It's not like they're going to get blown off the field in any of those games. And I know that a lot of Michigan fans want to see Harbaugh beat Ohio State. They want to see that. They've lost the first two years. They want to get that done in year three. I don't know that this is the year it happens, but because of, like you said, that transition period, maybe in year three where you've got a lot of younger guys, look for year four under Jim Harbaugh next season to be a year where they are a national championship front runner. Maybe not this year, but they're going to be close. Josh Parcell joining us from College Football Country. It's uh, launching in just a few days on August 1st. Please check him out there for a ton of content uh, in a number of different ways uh, and also on Twitter as well, at Josh Parcell. I'll group the rest of the Eastern Division together, and you can just let me know what uh, strikes you. Of course, Sparty took one of the biggest tumbles we've seen in recent college football history from a playoff team to 3-9. and nine. It's almost unthinkable. Mark D'Antonio has been a wizard there. And this is basically the first challenge or adversity that we've seen. Okay, where is this program headed? Looks like it could be in trouble. We know that the recruiting is not where it is against the teams that they've competed against, but he somehow made up for that in the past. But they could be in trouble. Maryland's on the come. Uh, 
Indiana, who knows now that Kevin Wilson's gone. And of course, Rutgers, uh, probably no reason to talk about them at all. So what hits you about the rest of this division? Not a whole lot. I mean, this we talked about at the beginning of this video about the Big Ten being maybe the strongest conference in college football. At the top, it certainly is, the teams we already talked about. But after you get through those top three or four teams, there's not a lot to write home about. And for Michigan State especially, you mentioned it being kind of a year where they need to figure out who they are as a program. It, last year's season came at the worst possible time because Michigan is on the rise, and now Michigan State, it's hard to battle up there for recruits in that area when you've already got schools like Michigan – and obviously Ohio State and Penn State recruiting extremely well. So I, I'm curious to see if Michigan State can recover. I think this is maybe a six-win team. I wouldn't call them anything better than that. I do like L.J. Scott at running back. I think he's very, very good. He was extre extremely good as a freshman. Last season wasn't quite as productive. But, yeah, Michigan State's going to be okay. Maryland's a program that if they can somehow pull off an upset win in year two under D.J. Durkin, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. It's an extremely young team as well, the, a lot of – Durkin's now first recruiting class isn't going to have much of an impact on the field in, in their first season. So there's not a lot to write home about. I'm not going to lie about the rest of the Big Ten East. I think it's those three teams and then not a whole lot else. But Maryland would be the one school that I have at least uh, I would be maybe buying stock in at this point going forward. Mark Rogers, TV talking uh, Big Ten Western Division with Josh Parcell. Uh, Josh, uh, Wisconsin fascinates me because they get the load of three-star guys. And uh, no, they're not Florida State, Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson. But they continue to churn out 10 and 2 and 9 and 3 and 10 and 2. And they've been doing it for 15 or 20 years, regardless of the head coach. And they continue. They have built a program and they know who they are and what they need to do. Now, this is not going to be a vintage Wisconsin team, but you've got reason to be hopeful that they could do something special. I agree. I think this is a two-game season for Wisconsin. They play Michigan towards the end of November. That's by far their hardest regular season game. If you look back two years ago in the Big Ten West, Iowa ran the table. They played virtually nobody. They were one game away from making the college football playoff. They ended up losing in the Big Ten championship game, making that Rose Bowl against Stanford where they got destroyed. But Wisconsin right now, if they can get through Michigan, Northwestern at home, Nebraska on the road, I mean, that, that's as hard as it gets for Wisconsin. I think this is a pretty good Wisconsin team. Alex Hornibrook last season played fairly well as a freshman. He was a very typical Wisconsin quarterback. But being so young, you'd think if he could take a step forward, that would be good. And they have good running backs. Uh, Bradrick Stewart is kind of the next up in line. Like you said, last 15, 20 years, we know what we're going to get out of Wisconsin. It's because we know what we get out of that running game and that offensive line. So I trust that they're going to find another 1,000-yard rusher. Taiwan Deal is a guy who has showed uh, spurts uh, and flashes of I wouldn't say brilliance, but certainly productivity in the last two years as a backup. So we're going to get a lot of the same thing out of Wisconsin. And I think that if all goes according to plan and they can avoid that dud of a game maybe against a team like Nebraska, this is a team that could be 11-1 and or 12-0 and going into the Big Ten Championship and find themselves one win away from a college football playoff. Hey, Josh, as we look at the rest of the Western Division, it's very much a milk and toast, a nuts and bolts, whatever phrase you want to throw in there. It's, it's a not an exciting, dynamic uh, group of schools. But if you love tough football, if you love throwback football, then you love the Big Ten Western Division. So you've got Iowa, which you mentioned came within like a yard of the championship game. Uh, of going to the college football playoff two years ago. And you've got Nebraska with Mike Riley. And that might be one of the tougher places to coach in college football because they know their tradition. So they think they should be this. But the recruiting base says that they can't be winning 11 and 12 games a year. And then you've got uh, P.J. Fleck coming onto the scene in Minnesota. And you kind of group those schools along with Northwestern. And maybe one of them jumps up and challenges Wisconsin. But that's kind of the group of schools that have a chance of making a championship run. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of riffraff in the rest of the Big Ten West. Not a lot to really be impressed with, to be honest with you. I think Iowa is a pretty decent team. But They've got to replace C.J. Beathard, who was a very good quarterback for them for the last several seasons. Akram Wadley may be the best running back in the Big Ten, certainly has a case to be. So he's probably the best player in the Big Ten West, in my opinion. But, yeah, outside of Iowa, Northwestern's got Clayton Thorson and Justin Jackson, two good players at, at the skill positions. But the rest of the, the outfit of that team isn't very competitive, I think, with a team like Wisconsin. So you're going to see the rest of that division beat up on each other. 
uh, to me, Wisconsin, it, it would be a flat out embarrassment if they don't win the Big Ten West and, and win at least seven games in the conference this season before they head to the Big Ten Championship. It's, it's just that much of a gap between them and the rest of that division. All right, folks. Uh, Josh Parcell, College Football Country. You got to catch him there. It launches on August 1st. That's the website, collegefootballcountry.com, for tons of great college football content. Josh, we always enjoy the discussion, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mark.